I was over and getting some coffee to keep myself awake this hour, so uh, Brother Pogue uh, was talking about going to sleep, so that might help uh, me stay awake a little bit. But um, those words by Brother Dub are so appreciated. Uh, I count him a very dear friend. He has stayed in our home uh, several times, and we have always benefited from that. And have loved and appreciated him through the years for his work's sake and because of who he is. Uh, the type of man that he is. And he is an encouragement to us young preachers. <laughs> He's the one who said I was a kid preacher when he <laughs> met me. So, uh... <laughs> what can... <laughs> Oh, he was just a kid, too. So he claims now. But, um, no, Brother Dub has been an encouragement to me, I'm sure he has to you, and to all faithful brethren, uh, because of the stand that he would take. Paul had been told some very disturbing news about the congregation at Corinth, he had been told this information by Chloe, or the house of Chloe. And as a result of that news, he writes the book of 1 Corinthians. And he's writing that to correct the problems, the mistakes that they were making, the false doctrines that had crept into the church. As he comes to the close of the book now, he gives them some very pointed commands in the imperative mo mode. And those commands are, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. There are those who claim that the, each one of these terms are militaristic terms. Others deny such, but whether they are or not, they can be used within the framework of military. They all have that military connotation, whether they were specifically that aspect or not. And so we start learning a lesson that when we become a Christian, we enter into the Lord's army. We don't like to hear and talk about that a great deal in the church today. We talk about being a family of God and we're coming into the love of God. But we don't hear too much about you're entering into an army. But that's what we are. And as a result of entering into an army, the work of an army is to fight, enter into a battle. And so that's our marching orders, to fight the good fight of the faith, and thus lay hold on eternal life. First uh, Timothy 6 and verse 12. But we would see many other passages in relationship to our need to fight. And in relationship to that Christian fight, these imperatives are important for us as well. They were important for the church at Corinth as they battled the errors that were there within the church at Corinth. They were important for them as they fought the worldly forces of evil and of Satan. We also battle those worldly forces of evil, and thus they're important for us. We have in our society evil all around us. It seems many times as if evil is winning the war, and thus we need these imperatives because we have an obligation to go out and take the fight to the, to the enemy. We have a battle within the Lord's church today. 
not even talking about denominationalism now and all of the errors of denominationalism, but within the church of our Lord, we have a battle that we are seeing. And it should be no surprise to us. Peter in Second Peter, the second chapter, says that there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall also be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. There's been false prophets in the past. There's false prophet teachers now. Why should we be surprised that now there's going to be false teachers? And Peter uses the phraseology that they're coming in by the side door, privily, privately. They don't come out in the open to do battle against uh, truth and right, but they try and sneak in by the side door. Now, we've been told about that. Why are we surprised when it happens? We shouldn't be. But then we have that admonition as a result, given by Jude in verse 3, to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered unto the saints. And thus, we need these admonitions. The very first one is to watch ye. In a war from a physical sense, the element of surprise is important. And many times an army can totally win the war because of the element of surprise. In the Uniform Code of Military Justice, it talks about the person who sleeps while on duty. And it says that during a time of war, if someone goes to sleep on duty, that person can be executed. His punishment can be death, or if not death, then certainly any punishment that a court-martial might determine. Why? Because it's a serious thing to sleep while on duty. They have that obligation to watch. Failure to watch in the spiritual realm is far more deadly than a physical army, though. Consider Peter. Jesus has taken Peter, James, and John, and he takes them into the garden, and then he leaves them to go and pray. He comes back and finds them asleep and tell, wakes them up, tells them, and notice Peter in particular, but he tells all of them, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Peter continued to sleep. A little while later, that same night, He's following Jesus afar off. We see in Matthew 26, verse 58 in particular. A little bit later than that, we see Peter denying his Lord three times. In verse 69 through 74. What if he had been watching and praying instead of sleeping? Watch and pray, Peter. You need to be on guard. And he slept. With the result, denying our Lord. And so, we immediately see that watching and prayer go hand in hand together. That's part of the means for watching, is to pray. Uh, In the listing of the Christian's 
Armour in Ephesians 6 chapter, he concludes it by saying, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Ephesians 6 and verse 18. But also, another means for watching would be a knowledge of God's Word. If you look at that Christian armor there in Ephesians 6 chapter, each one of them has a direct reference to the Word of God. When you look at your loins girt about with truth, well, there's truth. The breastplate of righteousness, righteousness, God's righteousness is revealed in the Scriptures, Romans 1, 16 and 17. Feet shod with the gospel, or feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Well, there's again the gospel that brings peace. And the shield of faith. Well, the faith is the word of God again. The helmet of salvation. And in salvation revealed for us, and the only way that we know it is through the word of God. And, of course, taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And so he deals specifically with a knowledge of God's Word. And when we go back to Matthew, the fourth chapter, and here's Jesus being tempted of Satan, we all know how he overcame the temptations. Each time he said, it is written. He was able to take God's Word, the law of Moses in this case, and properly apply that law of Moses, God's Word, to the temptation that was he was being faced with. No wonder the psalmist would say, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. We need to have a knowledge of God's word. But then we also need to know how to apply that word to specific sins that come upon us and temptations that come up. A lot of times we might know God's word, but we don't know how to apply it properly. We need both aspects. Jesus certainly knew and understood how to apply those passages that he called upon to this particular temptation that he was facing. Would we have known those things? And as a result of his knowledge and proper application, he was able to overcome the temptation. But Satan is real, and he's going to use whatever avenues that he can to fight against us. Some people, of course, don't even believe that Satan exists now, but Satan is a roaring lion walking about, seeking whom he may devour. He is real. And he's going to use the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, 1 John 2 and verse 16, in order to try to overcome us. He's going to use temptation uh, there that we read in Matthew, the 26th chapter and verse 41, while G- where Jesus says, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. Then he will use trials. James discusses trials, temptations, persecutions, troubles that we might have in life in James 2, uh, chapter 1, verses 2 through 12. And he teaches us that if we use them properly, they will be a blessing to us. But what if we don't use them properly? Then Satan will have gained the advantage. And thus we have to, Satan will use those trials and to his advantage, or try to. We have to make them, turn them around and use them to our advantage instead. He will also use false teachings and false teachers. Jesus said, of course, beware of false uh, prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves, Matthew 7 and verse 15. Now, why the warning? Because he knew that Satan was there and he was going to use false teachings and false teachers. And so he realized that, yes, those individuals are going to come appearing outwardly at least to be very religious, to be righteous, to be an exemplary Christian. 
but the end result of their teaching is that of destroying you. And so you have to be on guard. You have to watch. Uh, there that we read a moment ago in Second Peter 2, verses 1 and 2, how that there's going to be false teachers among you. And they're going to privily, privately bring in these damnable heresies. Verse 2, it mentions that many shall follow their pernicious ways. A lot of people are going to go after the false teachers. Isn't that what we've seen throughout history? Just go back. Look at the Old Testament and see what happened. When the church comes into existence in the first century, what happened shortly after? The majority of people followed error to the extent that you finally see the Roman Catholic system of religion. Within the United States and the Restoration Movement, in which men tried to go back to God's Word and did go back to God's Word. But what happened? Error comes up. Now, which one did the majority of people follow? How many congregations were saved among the Lord's church and how many went after the apostasy of the Christian church? I heard one time, I don't know the accuracy of it, but I heard that there in the state of Texas there was only one congregation or one building that was saved for the churches of Christ. And that one, from what it was told, was that there was a when they brought the instrument in, a little old lady got in her wagon, put the axe in her wagon, came to the building that afternoon and chopped it up and threw it in outside. And that that was the only congregation that was saved for the churches of Christ. Many shall follow their pernicious ways. Why, brethren, should we today who are trying to remain faithful to God in spite of the false teachings and the false compromises that are going on in the Lord's church today, be surprised that there's only a few of us that are remaining faithful? Why are we surprised at it? It's happened all through history that way. But we have to continue to watch because Satan's going to do that very thing and use that way to draw away disciples after them. And even Satan himself, it says, is going to appear as an angel of light. St. Corinthians 11th chapter, verse 14 and 15. And so if we're not watchful, on guard at all times, Satan's going to sneak in unawares privately by the side door, and he's going to destroy us. And so I need to watch. Let me also ask, uh, add to that, though. While we need to be watching against Satan and his forces and all that he's going to do, we also need to be watching for the opportunities to do good. Need to... Be watching for those opportunities to teach the gospel to others, to further the cause of Christ. Ours is not simply a defensive battle. We need to take the offensive to the forces of evil. And that means taking the gospel out into a lost and dying world. Look for opportunities. Watch for opportunities to do good. It said, of course, of Jesus, he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Let's be said of us as well that we went about doing good because we're looking and watching for the opportunities to do so. But then the second admonition, stand fast in the faith. Brethren, we need to be stable. We have far too many brethren 
who are just vacillating back and forth in any old which way. I remember an elder, well, let me change that. A supposed elder in the Lord's church who, when he was with one group, he would agree with them. He would get over with another group who was saying exactly the opposite thing of the first group, and he would agree with them. He'd get back with the first group, and he'd agree with them. He was a very agreeable person, just whoever he was with, he was agreeing with. And if, if, in reality, if he had gotten with denominational people, he would have been agreeing with them too. Back and forth, vacillating, never could depend on him. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter and verse 14, we're told that we should not be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And yet, how many brethren are exactly like what Paul is saying, don't be. We have brethren today who are vacillating between being hot, they're really on fire for the Lord, and then they're, it doesn't matter, they're cold. Brethren that can, you can never depend on them except to be undependable because that's the only way that they're going to be. Yes, they might be on fire and you ask them to do something, but before they never get it done, they don't care any longer. How many within the Lord's church do we know like that, though? We are repeatedly called throughout the Scriptures to faithfulness. That's dependability. Only those who remain faithful are going to receive a reward. Remember the good and faithful servant. Matthew, the 25th chapter and verse 21, both that one who had been given five talents and the one who had been given two talents. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with it. We've been called to that. But to be faithful, to stand fast in the faith, you must first be in the faith. That means that a person has to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're not going to, for time's sake, go into discussion of how we obey the gospel. Even though some members of the church seem to have forgotten some of those principles. But we also need to know the faith. In St. Thessalonians 2, in verse 15, Paul says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions that ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Stand fast, hold God's word. But how can you stand fast and hold God's Word if you don't know God's Word? It's an impossibility. We ha have to go to God's Word. We have to put in the time and the effort to study it. It doesn't come by osmosis, as some people think or seemingly think. That as long as they have a Bible there in their house that, why, everything's going to be hunky-dory. We must know all of it because even though we never open it, and we might on occasion grab hold of it, you know, dust it off, and bring it with us to services. There has to be time and effort being put into God's Word to learn God's Word mentioned earlier in relationship to Jesus how that he was able to take certain passages, certain teachings within the law of Moses and to use those and properly apply them to the temptations that Satan brought. Satan quoted the scriptures and some people think that's all you need to do. Well, Satan did it. 
But he misused those, the passage that he quoted, and Jesus recognized it was misused. How? Because he knew the Scriptures. And then he was able to take something else over here, another passage, and say, this is what really applies to this temptation. Now, we need to have a knowledge of God's Word, but know also how to properly apply those passages to the situations that come up today. Or otherwise, we're going to be going back and forth with the winds of doctrine. But we also need to realize that we cannot fight for those matters that are optional. Yes, an an optional matter must be authorized by God, but by the very nature of it being optional means that we do not have to do it. And yet some people will come along and try to bind those optional matters, and we cannot allow that either. And so we must be willing to go forego our rights in those areas. The third of those admonitions, those imperatives, quit you like men. This has been described in various ways. Be manly. Be invincible. Be resolute. Christians are not to be childish and weak, but instead they are to be manly and courageous in their demeanor. The Philistines are a good illustration of this. In 1 Samuel, the Philistines are at war with Israel, and Israel brings, because they don't think that as long as that physical Ark of the Covenant is there with them, that it can never be kept taken and they'll be, they'll be able to win the battle. And so they bring the Ark, and there's great shouting and excitement by the Israelites, and the Philistines very basically are scared. They are defeated now. The battle's lost. And they're bemoaning their situation. And they are told, quit you like men. Be strong. And let's go into the battle. And what happens? We know that they won the war. They won the battle. Brethren, we within the Lord's church today who are remaining faithful, trying to hold the line. The forces of evil shout that great shout. We're winning the battle. We're with God and we're going forward. And you little peons over there that you meet in congregations that you have to meet in your own house. And you're so small and insignificant, we won't even pay attention to you. We need the admonition to quit you like men and be strong. There's a battle out there and let's go fight the battle. And that's what Paul is saying. To the church at Corinth, yes, There's error that's, and you've fallen into a lot of sins. Now then, go fight the battle. Don't moan and groan and be defeated in your attitude. Yes, the battle might be seemingly overwhelming against us. But brethren, we have the Lord on our side, and with the Lord on our side, we will not be defeated. But if we listen to ourselves sometimes, how many times do we talk about that defeated attitude? Or talk like we have been defeated? No, we haven't. We're the victors. 
Oh, they might have gained a great number of people, but we're the victors, they're the losers. Because they are going to be lost because of their compromises, because of their false teachings, because they've submitted themselves to Satan instead of submitting themselves to God. And we are victorious. Now then, act like it. And that's what Paul is saying here. Quit you like men. We have been given God's word. Let's use it. Let's fight for it. Let's do what God wants us to do. And then be courageous in our fight with it. The word courage is defined as that quality of mind which enables one to face dangers, difficulties, threats, pain, etc. without fear. Bravery. Boldness. That's the way courage is defined. And that's what this admonition, quit you like men, is saying. You be courageous in the face of the enemy. And so as evil in our society and Satan gaining more and more power seemingly within our society and the evil abounding, don't be cowards in the face of the enemy. Be strong. Be courageous. Be bold in your proclamation of the truth. Oh, but wait, you know, those homosexuals out there, those perverts that are, they've got a lot of power. And if you say anything against their perversions, then they might come and they might do something. We might end up in jail. So what? Are we going to be cowards or are we going to be bold? Quit you like men. And so, yes, there's evil all around us. Satan is out there. And he is trying to destroy us. And we've got to take the battle to him. And we've got to be strong and courageous. And yes, realize, Satan is no weakling out there. You know, he is, again, he is a roaring lion. Roaring lion is not a weakling. He has a lot of strength and a lot of power. But we can defeat him. And we will defeat him. That's really what the book of Revelation is all about, isn't it? That the Christian is victorious. As long as he's with God. Lack of courage, though. It's continually condemned within the scriptures. God hath not given us the spirit of timidity or cowardice. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7. The fearful and unbelieving and the abominable murderers and so forth, they're going to have their part in the lake of fire which burneth, or lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, Revelation 21 and verse 8. Brethren, when we become timid and fearful in the face of the enemy, then we're lost. We need to repent. We need boldness to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Acts 4th chapter, here's the apostles being told, basically, don't preach anymore in the name of Christ. If you do, you're going to come into big problems. They're released, they go and they pray for boldness, Acts 4 and verse 29. The results, verse 31, and they spake the word of God with boldness. We need to be praying that we would be bold, courageous in preaching the gospel to a lost and dying world. We also need, brethren, to be and have the courage to further that cause of Christ in the face of great opposition. 
We need brethren who are willing to defend the cause of Christ against false teachers and their doctrine. And brethren, we can, just as Jesus did, put Satan and his forces to flight by wielding the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But will we do it? And do we do it? Then the fourth imperative, be strong. Some connect this with quit you like men and basically say it's one imperative, but we'll use it or discuss it as two. And the reason may put it together is because you cannot really be courageous without the accompanying strength. And so we need strength. Our strength comes from God. Ephesians 6 chapter, verses 10 and verse 11. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. How is the Christian strengthened? Well, we've got old Mac Deaver over here and says, well, you're going to be strengthened directly within your heart. That the Spirit is going to impact your spirit. He teaches Wesley, Wesleyanism. He's now gone beyond that to teach Calvinism. But that's not the way. The way in which we're going to be strengthened in the inner man is through the Word of God. And we need thus to go back to a detailed learning of God's Word and study of that Word. We need to be abounding in prayer because, again, going back to what Jesus told Peter, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. So prayer is an important part of being strong. And then an important part of being strong is work. When an individual wants to build up his strength, he starts exercising. Whether it be lifting weights or other aspects, he starts exercising to gain that physical strength. To grow spiritually, we've got to get out and start exercising. Doing what God wants us to do, fighting the battles that God presents to us. And then we need to avoid evil influences. We are to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And thus, be strong. After these four militaristic imperatives, Paul gives another imperative, though. And that is, let all things be done with charity or with love. And that's that word agape, and we had a great lesson earlier on the aspect of love. And we would just simply reiterate the things that are set forth within that lesson, that we need love. The entire law being summed up in love for God and love for our fellow man. But love for God and love for our fellow man does not mean that we're going to be weak and vacillating and give in to their error and their sin. Instead, it means that we're going to be strong, we're going to fight, we're going to be courageous, we're going to enter into that battle, we're going to expose their error. That's love. That's true love, a type of love that the denominational world and that our Loving brethren, do not know and do not realize. But that's the type of love that God expects us to have. The need for these imperatives, so great and so needful. Yes, we need to watch ye. Stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. Let all things be done in love.